lies one day at a time. Kimmy Kim and Elation's Radio. They're here to get your day going fine. Kimmy Kim and Elation's Radio. Kimmy Kim and Elation's Radio. Kimmy Kim and Elation's Radio. And here's your host, Miss Kim. God bless you. I am Apostle Irvin Whitlow, and I want to invite you to listen to Making Marriage Meaningful. Join me as we talk about marital matters. It's real. It's raw. It's relevant. Every Saturday night at 10 p.m. Eastern, 9 Central, on Elation Radio. Yeah. 
And a welcome, 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 welcome. We're grateful to be here tonight that the Lord has blessed us to be here for Making Marriage Meaningful. I am your host, Apostle Irvin Whitlow, and I am grateful that the Lord has allowed us one more opportunity to come together. I pray that tonight something will be said that will help you, that will bless you, that will strengthen you in your marriage and relationship in particular. Now, I always make this, uh, this disclaimer. I am not a relationship expert. I just share the things that God has given me to share. The other thing I'd like to submit to you, uh, and this is another disclaimer, that this conversation, it is real. It is raw, but it is relevant. So you might hear some things that might make you scratch your head, but it's only to challenge your thinking. Amen. Now, let me also say this. I don't do this all by myself. God has blessed me with some people who have experienced some things in life that is able to share with me, and uh, we'd like to share with you. Amen. First, I want to uh, present my brother from another mother who is the pastor of Power Stand Outreach Ministry all the way from uh, Upper Marlboro, Maryland. His name is Elder Ernest E. Richard, Jr. Are you with me, my brother? Yes, I am, sir. The Lord bless and keep you. So happy and so glad that I can be among the living. As the saying goes, I'd rather be seen than be viewed. So bless God for another day to be seen. Bless you, sir. <laughs> Amen. So grateful to you. Amen. We're going to head a little further up north. We're going to head a little further up north. Amen. I've got a sister up there in uh, the Newark, New Jersey area who makes sure that my hair always looks decent. Amen. Would you please welcome with me Sister Glenda Johnson. Are you here, my sister? Praise God, praise God, I am here today. Hope all is well. Happy 4th of July. Looking forward to this Amen. broadcast tonight. Amen. Thank you so much. So glad that you're here. Amen. Let me head a little further up north, amen, to the the New Haven, Connecticut region. I got another brother up there who is a preacher and a professor, a teacher and prophet, a great man of God. Amen. And uh, he's the pastor of the Morning Star volume of the book, uh, Ministry Deliverance International Incorporated, and the uh, prelay of the volume of the book, Deliverance International Ministry Incorporated. Amen. That's my good brother, uh, Chief Apostle Vincent L. Smith. Are you joining us, sir, tonight? Yeah, but dabba do you better believe, man. I'm here and ready to get funky with it. Yes, sir. Let's do this thing. Let's do this thing. He did not come on the line with some Fred Flintstone yabba dabba do. Gee whiz. No, he, I thought only I did that. No, no, so that says. That wasn't no, that wasn't no Fred Flintstone. Come on, man. Come in the 70s with me. That was Fred <laughs> Yes, it was. That was Boosie Collins. Yabba dabba doozable. <laughs> I, I believe that right there. Amen. I, I want to see tonight. I, I don't know. I'm going to check. I'm just going to check because I'm not certain that she, she called in or not, but we're going to see. I'm looking for the quiet storm. That's that, that quiet preacher who got a great word in her belly. She's in Indianapolis, Indiana. I'm talking about Elder Anna Henderson. Are you here tonight, woman of God? She's going to be a little late. Okay, so she's running late. All right. Well, I want to definitely hear from our producer, the one, the only, the lovely Kimmy Kim. Are you here? Would you say something to us tonight in Jesus' name? Hello. My name is Kimmy Kim. I am blessed and winning in the Lord. Amen. Amen. Blessed and winning. Did you hear that? She came in here like, hey, I'm blessed and winning. I'm not just blessed. I'm blessed and winning. Ooh, praise God. Well, we're so happy to have each and every one of you. Amen. We're looking forward to what the Lord is going to do tonight. We don't want to prolong the time. We want to get back into this topic that we've been talking about for some time. Amen. And I believe that God wants to share some things and impart some things to his people. So I need you all to join me. Uh, Overseer Elder Richard, would you pray us in tonight? Yes, I will. Precious Father, in the name of Jesus, we give honor and glory to you. Thank you for the entrance of your word, which always brings light, God. We thank you for this opportunity to allow us to celebrate what America calls Independence Day. But, God, little do they know, Independence Day started the day we said yes to your will. And so freedom fighters for the kingdom, we 
for you, asking that you would take total charge and control over this service, over this particular podcast, God. We put it into your hands. We bind the hand of the adversary. We loose the angels of the Lord to walk up and fro and throughout the entire sanctuary, throughout the entire airwaves, or wherever this message is being heard, whether they're catching it live or catching it in a podcast or seeing it later on Facebook, God, we need you to edify, to magnify, and to lift people up, Heavenly Father. Bring them to a brand new place. As my brother would say, let them terrorize the name of Jesus be glorified. Edified and everybody gets sanctified. We put it into your charge and care, for this is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Let me go ahead and read our theme scripture that we've been using and we will continue to use until the Lord says otherwise. Genesis 2 and 18 through 25 it says, And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help me for him. I'm going to preach that at some point. Are you lonely tonight? I'm going to preach that at some point. Amen. In the meantime, it says, And out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. Whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave names to all cattle, and to the fowl of the air, and to the beast, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found an help meet for him. And the Lord God called the deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs, and closed up the flesh, and said thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave to his wife. They shall be one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. So many things I'm looking at when I look at it tonight that I'm saying, okay, Lord, you're talking in a big way. But we've been talking about matching God's meaning. And in talking about matching God's meaning, we have dealt with how God has structured marriage and structured uh, this relationship to be. Uh, That is supposed to be the foundation of society. We have discussed how things are to formulate, that is combining to create. We talked about how your design, your desire must match God's design. We talked about not only the form, we talked about the frame, amen, kind of the mindset that you have, what do you do for a living, amen, and your morals. We talked about those things. And we went from that and we really began to deal with this relationship chair which we have dealt with the foundation, which is commitment. We've dealt with the three legs, and we're dealing now with the fourth leg. The three legs we've dealt with extensively is friendship leg, the the fellowship leg, the family leg, and in the family leg we dealt with uh, a good good husband and father, good mother, wife, the children's role. We talked about age difference. We talked about a blended family, and then – we are now talking about finances. And before we got there, we began talking about a support system, and we determined what it was that he needed and what she needed uh, to determine what they need to support each other. And we, we made a spinoff from her needs of financial commitment to talking about finances. And we made up in our mind that in our discussion last week, that as long as she has him and he is married to her, that she don't have to worry about a financial commitment because where he is, so will his finances be. And if his heart is there, so will his finances be. And if his love is there, so will his finances be. But if he's made uh, an attempt to be with her, then she don't have to worry about it. It's when things happen that changes that, that becomes the issue. And so we talked about 
we started talking about finances last week. One of the biggest things that we wanted to look at is that if you're in a committed relationship, particularly your marriage, then you and your partner owe each other a calm, honest conversation about each other's finances, habits, goals, and anxieties. Listen to me. A lot of people are in trouble right now because they want to keep their finances secretive. I want you to know that if you plan on being in a long time, a long term marriage, and you're keeping your finances secretive, then you are not really giving yourself to the marriage. Because you cannot possibly give part of you to the marriage without the other part. See, one part is your heart and your mentality and your sexuality, but there's another part that includes your possessions and, 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 and what you have. You can't come to the marriage and just bring only a little bit and don't bring everything. Because if you're not bringing everything, you're not really going to have a marriage point blank period. Okay? Uh, and, and so these are some of the things that have become an issue. Um, and, and, and so I want to dive back into this. I want to dive back into this. And I want to pick up here saying this, that this is where the ego anxieties about control and notions of marital roles will have to be checked. See, because what I've discovered is that when you're working together, you can achieve more than you could being single. But, 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 but here's the thing. There's a problem if you don't want to deal with your finances in your marriage because you make a greater portion of the monies. Because at, at the end of the day, if I make $5 and you make $55, you can't get mad at me because I'm giving what I have and you have more to give and you don't want to give it. That becomes a problem. And what happens is now we have a play of ego. Well, I make the money. So I call the shots. I bring home the bacon. And what happens is it causes major breakdown because when you begin making another person feel insignificant or inferior because of finances, what you really do is you really break down their ability to communicate with you because they feel like they have been violated. Worst thing you can do is violate somebody who is doing what they can do, and at this point in time, it's the best they can do. Maybe their job was downsizing. Maybe they had to do budget cuts. Maybe there were some other things that happened. But you can't beat up on the other individual who is doing all that they can to do the best they can, and then you look at them as they're insignificant and inferior. I believe that a whole lot of uh, that a little bit of something is better than a whole lot of nothing because what I have discovered is we're living in a time where you have men who will who will do all the work and the woman won't do nothing and then on the other hand you have women who will work themselves like silly and the man will do nothing so therefore there has to be a balance so that we both understand the responsibility when it comes to finances. Come on, Overseer. I know you want to say something right there. Well, I'm going to put this in there, and I uh, want to say uh, I thank God for your, your, your opening dissertation there. Too many people have to, first of all, recognize, you know the old saying, honesty is the best policy. And for some strange reason, we don't believe that. We tend to think that a little honesty is the best policy. My mother used to say years ago, and I'll never forget this, it will always be a part of my life. She used to say a half-truth is still a whole lie. So if you have a small taste of honesty and even a tidbit of dishonesty in the midst of your finances, you're actually lying to your spouse. And you're turning around and putting that relationship in a jeopardized position because she's expecting you to come across with A, B, and you're hiding C and D. And then you get in trouble and you're 
see C and D, but because you've been doing other things with C and D, and she finds out later that you had this extra money that could have got them out of trouble. I know what I'm talking about because I've been down this road, so I'm being a bit transparent when I share this with you. When you're in a position when it's time to pay the rent and you're about $150, $200 short and your spouse is holding on to that kind of money to do something else that ain't probably ungodly, number one. Number two, going to buy something that she probably don't need, and the next thing you know, you get eviction notice. My brother, there's a problem there. There's an issue there. Right. What happened to the integrity of the marriage? What happened to the balance in the marriage? You can make more money than me, and that's fine. Or I can make more money than you, but at the end of the day, we have to come together. Why do you think the scripture says, this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave to his wife? The two must become one in every aspect of the word. I'm going to just hold it right there. Apostle Smith? Well, uh, I'm, I'm going to make this short statement. Uh, whenever there's a secret of how you deal with things, also remember with every secret, there's a day of revealing. That's there's right. There's a day of things coming to the opening. And then to give you scripture, it says whatever is done in the dark shall be brought to the light. So mm-hmm. it's better. It's better to take your five dollars and make sure it worked for the best than to hide it. And then it becomes a problem at the day of sunshine. All right. Thank you. Amen. 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 Uh Sister Glenda. Uh amen. Uh, uh only thing I have to add is when that comes about, it you know that comes from now control, uh, feeling that uh, they have control because they are making more, and somehow the scriptures have gone out of the relationship, and so it's a breakdown in the relationship. So now they have this ego going, whereas hey, uh, you know, as you said before, I make all the money, so. I make the I'm the one making the decisions. So that's where uh we need to come together and have a discussion about um whether whoever whoever it is, whether it's you make five dollars, she make ten or whatever, um, it's all going into one because we supposed to be one body. To come together as one, correct? Amen. Amen. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, now, here's what I want to do. I want to look at this so much more in depth because the thing that keeps standing out to me is that when you have one who makes more than the other, how they use it as a sense or a form of control. And when I mm-hmm. say that, you have, you have him who makes all this money, and then what he wants to do is he wants to restrict her with what she can and cannot do. But then on the mm-hmm. other side, when she makes all the money, so to speak, then what she wants to do is she want to, she wanna, in a sense, uh, belittle his manhood. That's how I want to mm-hmm. say it. Because, yeah. mm-hmm. oh, well, I make the money, so since I make the money, then you less than a man. Oh, well, then why is it that he's less than a man? Because he doesn't make so you make so you make thirty five thousand dollars a year and he only makes twenty two thousand dollars a year. Why is he less than a man if he's constantly working himself on a regular basis, trying to do what he can to make sure that he's making ends meet? Because what I've discovered is that there are a lot of men who die early, and they die early because they are doing all they can to please that woman financially, knowing that she is high maintenance, and some stuff is totally unnecessary, uncalled for. We live in such a world today where, you know, they just got to have this, they just got to have that. And I am not against anybody having nice things, but I really believe that your marriage and the responsibilities of the marriage should be priority or financially, because if it's not, then it's going to create other issues. And what happens is when she begins to believe 
belittle his manhood, all of a sudden he's no longer interested in her. And then not to mention when he's asking her for her time, he's asking her for her affection, he's asking for her attention, he's asking for her loving, and she's denying him and rejecting him, eventually he's going to get tired of asking. And when he gets tired of asking... When he gets tired of asking, then she's going to get mad. And then she's going to be like, well, why are you stepping out on me? Why are you stepping on me? Well, first of all, you done belittled me because I didn't make the same amount of money as you did, and you didn't think I was good enough to be your man. And so, therefore, uh, so and so and so. I remember I watched a, 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 a picture, a movie some time ago. Um, it was entitled A Good Man is Hard to Find. And in this movie, I remember that I believe her name is Golden Brooks, one of the gold, one of those uh, uh, f- friends, girlfriends, right? She was in it. She was the star woman in it. And she was married to a man who was a deacon in the church, right? And he was so focused on doing what he could in the church and everything, but he had his own business. He was a, he was an auto mechanic. He did, he did tune-ups and fixed cars and things like that. You know, that's what his livelihood, that was his livelihood. But she, on the other hand, had this man major degree in doing consulting and whatnot. And so she got a job in the offering, the starting offer for her pay was $250,000 a year. And she came home one night and said to him, I'm not happy. Do you know the price of being ignorant? Now, all of a sudden, here's he, here's he trying, he's trying to do all he can to work and make sure she's happy, the needs are met, trying to teach the son good morals and things, trying to take care of things at the church. And while he's doing all of that, she thinking, oh, well, he don't pay me no attention, so he must have something else going on. While, in fact, what was happening is she was doing something with the with her boss, right? And then she wanted to blame him. Uh, but but, but mm-hmm. she wasn't thinking that this was a together thing. Look at this again. Let me show you this. Watch this again. Watch this again. God made this clear. He said it's not good. It's not beneficial. It is not healthy for a man to be alone. Why? Because there are things that I want man to accomplish. So God says I'm going to create him a help me. So what, do you, what is it that God, why would God create a help me for the man? Because the man will work himself silly. Not only that, the man needs um, sometimes some men, not all, some men need some things put in perspective. Some men need some things to be put in a particular way so that it can come into fruition. Uh, that's why a woman has a womb, so she can bring birth, she can bring birth to some of those ideas and some of the things that are in him that he cannot do on his mm-hmm. own. But one of the things that she's supposed to help him with is the responsibilities, and that comes from happening with finances. Come on, talk to me, Chief Apostle. Listen, listen, here's the sad part. Here's the sad part in this money issue is that even when the language of the home changes, now because you make a little something that's higher than his or he makes something that's higher than hers, the thought the thought of we're in this together flies out the window. And mm-hmm. then you start hearing that language. Uh, what do you want? Well, this is my house. Mm-hmm. This is uh, you sitting on my furniture. You 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 laying in my bed and all. Well, well, well. Until you started making that kind of money, and tell you the truth, uh, let let me let me tell the truth. Sometimes folks ain't making no kind of money and talking that foolishness. Yeah. Oh. Sometimes okay. it's just ignorant. Sometimes it's just ignorant in the mind. I ain't going to be in control. I'm going to manipulate the situation. I, I, I'm going to run things because that's who I am. I got to mm. be large and in charge. Okay. Mm-hmm. Got to be large so and in charge. Yeah, so you start getting into that old foolish talking. This is my house, and if you don't like it, go find your own place. Well, wait a minute. Mm-hmm. I want the scriptures that let a man leave his mother and father and come to his wife. Okay. Now, you, you talking about putting him out, putting her out. Well, y'all ain't had no business cleaving. 
Mm-hmm. Oh. Exactly. Wow. See, sometimes, wow. Sometimes, sometimes these things are issues that's already in the heart. Mm-hmm. And let me throw this in there with that. And sometimes it ain't got nothing to do with the last relationship. Some folks just nasty in their spirit. Oh, I'm sorry. No, I'm not. Go ahead. <laughs> well, that's true. Come on, overseer. Well, I'm going to concur with uh, Chief Apostle Smith in all that he is saying. And the only one thing I, I, I'm going to put there, and I don't want to go uh, too far out of bounds here, but I have to look at something else. In the process of all that, you made mention of that particular movie, and I remember that movie that you talked about. The main thing that I saw in that movie was the fact that this young lady, well, this person's ego, I'm going to say that without giving the movie away because I know some people haven't seen it yet. This person's ego got the best of them in the process of mm-hmm. all that was going on. And this is something that we really, really have to be careful of when we're dealing with each other from an emotional standpoint. When a woman emasculates a man, she puts a man in a position he will either respond in a negative fashion or he will just mm-hmm. throw in the towel and say, I got to go, I ain't got to deal with this, you know, sugar, honey, iced tea. Y'all get the picture. Come on, mm-hmm. let's stop being little children in this mm-hmm. place. So really the truth of the mm-hmm. matter is you have to understand the, the the delicacy and the balance of this whole thing as you're dealing with it. And then you need not feel like less than what you are because of the simple fact that you are still the head of house, whether you make the most money or the least amount of money, because as a prophet, priest, and king, you still have to lead your family. There are three areas, and Apostle, I don't want to go back because you already covered them, but we got to remember, we got to deal with communication. We got to deal with sex, and we must deal with money because the Bible crystal clearly says money answers all things, and we have to realize that hallelujah ain't going to pay the rent. Thank you, Jesus ain't going to keep the gas on. Lord, I love you is not going to keep the lights on. Jesus, you're awesome, is not going to keep the water bill paid. Somewhere down the line, you've got to divide and conquer. And I don't mean each other. I mean them bills with the money that you have. Amen. 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 Come on. Talk to me. Uh, I I just wanted to add, um, I I knew of a couple of um, this woman pretty much, and I guess I could say it like this, she she bought the man right up front. She brought him into the state, uh, had him to live with her. With her. They married. Uh, she bought him a car. She bought him clothes. She bought him this. But somehow she, I guess you say, emasculated him or she made him feel inferior. And you know what happened? He just rolled right away with the car, the clothes, everything. Mm -hmm. He felt he didn't have a say, but he bought into it. You know, he bought into a woman that bought him everything, did everything, and allowed him to do his own thing. But And at the end of the day he rode off in the sunset with all of the things that she bought him because I guess he wasn't okay. getting the respect. Mhm. Mhm. See, let me let me let me say this because here's one thing here's something that becomes an issue. Unfortunately, many people are not taught financial responsibility from their childhood growing up. Because I learned that there are two types of people. There are shoppers and there are savers. And both of them are good, but both of them are also bad. Mm -hmm. Because you can shop too much and wind up with too little. But you can save too much and wind up with nothing. See, Mm -hmm. I I really believe that people lack balance in such matters. Now, having said that, remember, I said that working together – it does a whole lot more. Couples can achieve a whole lot more working together than when they're single. But now here's the thing. Most single folk, watch this, most single folk are broke. And they're broke Mm -hmm. for one of five reasons. 
Most single folk who are broke, they're broke because of their feelings. They feel like they have to spend this. They feel like they have to do this. They feel like they have to do that. Oh, they just feel it, feel it, feel it, feel it. A new pair of shoes. I feel like I need those shoes. My hair. I feel like I need my hair. Uh, my nails. I feel like I need my nails. I, my, man, they got this new. They got this new gadget down there at Sears. I feel like I got to get. It. They're operating on feelings. That's the first thing. The second thing is they're always trying to do for family. That is dangerous because if you make it a habit, then you will always have to do for a family, and they will never rely on their own ability. I remember some years ago, I watched a commercial. I was living in Akron, Ohio, and when I was living there, I saw a commercial, and it said something of this, of this nature. It says, teach a man, no, it says, give a man a fish, he'll eat for a day. But teach a man to fish, and he'll never go hungry. And what, what has happened is when you give to your family all the time, then what happens is they'll always depend on you to give to them, and they will never learn what they need to to get their own. And I, when I was a kid, they used to sing a song. Um, by matter of fact, Patty LaBelle sang a song that said, God bless the child who has his own. Then here's the other thing. You got so you got your feelings, you got your family, then you got your friends. And what I discovered is when you have money, you have friends. But when you have not no money, you don't know nobody. I'm trying to tell you. And these are the things that you know, and some of these friends, they are slick. Let me say it like this. They're manipulative because what they'll do is they'll come and see about you as long as you will put the bill for them everywhere you go. Oh, well, you know, I ain't got it today. Won't you take care of this and take care of that? And you'll find yourself doing it, and they will use you as a mule, okay? Then there's the other thing that keeps you broke is food because every single day you want to eat out. You want pizza today. You want a burger tomorrow. You want Chinese food the next day. You want Italian food the next day. You want Mexican food the following day. And then you want any kind of food the next day. And before you know it, you're wondering why is it that you don't have nothing in your house. It's because you're always spending money on food. And finally, then the other thing that keeps singles broke is they always want to have fun. I'm not against I'm not against uh experiencing life and entertainment. I'm not against it, but I don't think it should be mandatory. It should not be the priority. I mean, every concert you got to go to, every movie that come out you got to go to, you, know, you want to go to every amusement park. Let me tell you something. Sometime last year, I was when I was uh when I went to bed, when my buried my father last year, I was on my way back, glory to God, and I said, I'm going to go to a music. I'm going to take a day and I'm going to go to a amusement park. I'm not going to go to work. I ain't gonna do. I'm gonna go to the amusement park. I called to find out how much it was for the amusement park, and them people told me sixty nine dollars a per for one person, and 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 forty nine for a, a child above forty eight inches. I said the devil is a dirty dog. Like I will save my money. I ain't. I can do. I find me something else to do. I go to the store and buy me a cotton pick and slip and slide. Get a water hose and put on my t shirt and some shorts. Run outside and jump on that slide and get wet. That I ain't spending no sixty nine dollars. What? I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. I had a moment. I had a moment. Yes, sir. On what, on what you're saying, on what you're saying, I really wish at that moment we had a way to hook in Fantasia. Come on here now. Fantasia tells the story that so she won. On the show she was on and started making some money. She said she was trying to help this one, trying to help that one. She said, but the thing that got her the worst was trying to help her brother. She said, and mm. I, she said, I really did. She said, I really didn't even notice it at first. She said, but I'm paying for his car. I'm paying for this. I'm paying for that. She said, and he got so comfortable, said this rascal wasn't doing nothing but lay around the house. <laughs> said, when he trying to find a job or, or do something <laughs> constructive at least, said he got used to me taking care of everything. She said, and I was doing it because I loved him. 
She said, but I didn't realize I was crippling him. Amen. Enabling. And see, that's the main problem. The main problem is not that we help our families, but how far we go in that help. Mm-hmm. You, can cause a person, you can cause a person not to mature when you do it. That's so, right. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Lord. The problem is you're no longer helping. You done took over. Okay. And they know well, all they well, do is pick up the phone and call you, and it's already done. Mm. Here you can't hardly do what you got to do, but somebody calls mm. you on the phone. I need a hundred and fifty dollars. Oh well, well, just give me about fifteen minutes and then, and look at your cash app, or let me let me get you the thing, and, and then and then let me run, let me run back, let me run back, and then that same scenario we were just talking about, then you keep it a secret from the mate. Mm-hmm. Now Double you done trouble. let this money you done let this money out and old Billy Boy don't pay you back. Uh oh. My God. Mm. If you give it to me today, I have it back to you by Monday. Monday done came five times and still ain't got your money. Mm-hmm. So when it's time wow. to do something, when it's time to do something, and you knew that that 150 was supposed to be added on to whatever you had to do, but you done gave it to Billy Boy. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And Billy Boy ain't even thinking about paying you back. Billy Boy mm-hmm. somewhere laughing and, 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 and dogging somebody else in the family. He done got 150 from you. He done got 175 from my best friend. He done, he done got 60 uh, from, from Cousin Jim. He walking around with five hundred dollars and here you can't do what you need to do. Amen. Jesus. See, my, father, my, father, my father told me years ago that when I had uh, one of the young guys from the church came over to the house to me one day, I looked in the pot. And there was a pot, a turkey leg in the pot. Just being mm-hmm. kind of a man, as a man, you want something to eat. But I didn't know the rascal was going to eat the whole pot of turkey legs. <laughs> Lord have mercy. <laughs> so, my, as, but as, as we're eating, I'm realizing, I said, wait a minute. I said, something ain't right. Because there was nothing on the stove but the turkey legs. That's when it hit me. I said, oh, shoot, my mother hadn't even finished cooking yet. Mm, wow. I said, this boy done ate up the whole family meal. Mm-hmm. So, when they, so when they got home and looked in the pot and there was nothing there but bones, I mm-hmm. said, well, so such a one was over here. I said, no. I, was, I was just being nice. Ask them if they want some. I said, and they never stopped. My father told me that day, he said, son, you better learn how to get wise. And I don't mean potato chips. <laughs> mm-hmm. And he said to me, he said to me, he said, now, he come from a family just like we are family. He said, I guarantee mm-hmm. you, he can't do that in his house. Bring you in there. And you and him gonna sit in there and eat up everything, and the family ain't had nothing. Mm. He said, "I guarantee you, you would never be allowed over there again." Mm. Right. And that's just what my father did to him. He told him, "If we ain't here, don't you come in." Okay. Because you know that. See, if we ever put the brake on people, that. That's where the problem come at, brother. We don't put the brakes on. We just keep giving, keep giving, keep giving. And mm-hmm. after a while, somewhere in, there, somewhere in there, the question ought to be, hold up. Why yeah. do you always need something? Mm-hmm. You ain't now got true. nothing. Yeah. Let, yeah. let me, let me yeah. do that. Let me, do that let me throw something in there real quick. And there's a, uh-huh. a passage of scripture that goes along with what you're talking about, Apostle Smith. When you're 
<coughs> excuse me, look at Proverbs chapter 11, verse 15. And basically, it's just simply saying that he that is surety for a stranger so smart for it. And it's not just a stranger that you'll smart for it. Basically, all it's simply saying is you give away money that your spouse has no knowledge of. There's going to come a point in time where, as you already said, that money's going to be required. It's not going to be there, and you're going to find yourself in a very delicate situation. Now you got to explain to baby girl what happened to the money. But I like the second mm-hmm. half of that same scripture that says he that hated suretyship is sure. <clears throat> the truth of the matter is, if you're going to give out money and not tell your spouse, and I'm not encouraging any man or woman to do this, I would encourage you to speak with your sweetheart and get on the same page. Because it's a terrible thing when you find out that something happened that you knew nothing about because now you start feeling a certain kind of way and you start losing that level of trust, that level of confidence, and in some cases Mm -hmm. a level of insecurity comes to the surface. And so now she starts watching you with the eagle eye. So now what do you do? But the truth of the matter is if you would just turn around and just skip past giving out loans, period, I mean, I'm, I've gotten to the point now with family members. They'll call me and see me and my sister are on the same page, my younger sister are on the same page because we have family members. I'm going to leave them, nieces and nephews. I'm going to leave them out and not tell you who they are. But, you know, the only time I hear from them is when they need money. The rest of the oh. time I don't hear from them. So I've come yeah. to the point now they call, uh, do you have X amount of money? Yeah, I got it. Well, can I borrow it? You mean can you steal it? Can you have it? Because uh, you certainly don't mean you borrow it because you ain't going to pay it back. And then I got to remind them of the long debt that they got from, you know, past loans. And if I put interest on those loans, I could probably buy another house. My point is simply this. If you come to the point in place where you don't lend it out, I got it but you can't get it because your past performance told me already that you're not going to keep your word. So I'm going to let that go. Can, can I ask a question right there, though? What's uh, that? Something, something just hit my mind. So so that we can give explanation to those listening, how does that scripture work? And, and where does it fit? When it said, when a person asks you, for money, count it a seat. That's what it says. How? Where in this conversation to give explanation to those listening? When uh, well, is it? When, when? When in our giving or lending to people? How? How do we determine what we need to call a seed and that that we need to look back for? Well, I think I think I think I want to I want to I want to put it in one of two sorry in one of two ways. I, I was listening to Bishop T.D. Jakes, and he was sharing something that caught my attention. He said that he got he he learned he he has two different financial lists. His first financial list is his gotta do list. He mm-hmm. said his second financial list is his wanna do list. So the got to do is that which is prioritized. The want to do is that which is miscellaneous. Now, I'm I'm going somewhere with this. Here again, what, what what I would love to do is encourage couples, married, considering marriage. I want to encourage you to conversate about finances. That's the whole purpose of tonight's discussion. I want to encourage a discussion concerning finances because we, we need to know, we need to know who thinks what about money? Who has what with who has what habits with money? Where is your priority concerning money? And 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 having said that, here's the biggest thing that I think becomes the is the 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 importance. The Bible says, write the vision, make it plain. I think that it's imperative that when you talk about money, you immediately begin working on a budget. Now, in doing a budget, you understand that God is first, 
point blank, period. There's no ands, no ifs, no buts about it. And when I say God is first, I'm talking about you take God's off the top. So if you make $1,000 every two weeks and he makes $800 every two weeks, well, then $100 from you, $80 from him automatically comes off the top. I don't care what Uncle Sam took. Give God his first that is prioritizing. Then, after you prioritize, you still need to take, you still need to have an offering. For the Bible says that we have robbed God in tithes and offerings. So, which means that God don't only expect tithes from you, but he expects an offering as well. Because we don't have time to go into it, but the tithe is to take care of the priest, the Levi, and the widow. And the offering takes care of the expenses of the facility. Nobody don't want to deal with that, and we and Apostle Smith dealt with that some a uh, few days ago when he talked about having to bring a different uh, certain percentage when you're late or whatever you borrow on ties or whatnot. But what I'm saying is when you have a prior when you prioritize, then not only would you have taken to uh, for God and for your so for your seed and showing, but somewhere in there you should be able to say, well, let, in case. Just in case somebody might have a need, let's put this aside. This is my mm-hmm. this is my this is my commentary. This is Apostle Whitlow one and eight. Put something aside time. after you have discussed it. Does do I make any right. sense there? You yeah. do, Apostle. Let me say this: uh, the uh, average family, the average family does not do what you just made mention of. The average family has a habit of uh, taking that which they have and basically burning out what they have. You got people nowadays, especially since COVID-19, and in some cases it was a necessity, and in other cases they did not have to do it. They've made burnt offerings out of their credit cards. Cards with $1,000 limits, $5,000 limits. Now they're so far in debt, it looks like they're swimming in, in, in debt, basically. But you don't see too many. And the handful that would do it or even try to do it, make some kind of attempt to do it, it's got little or nothing because of what, whatever they're, you know, well, let me say it like this. It, this makes the most sense. And I hope I make sense when I say what I'm about to say. Be pr- prior to the storm, in this case, COVID-19, prior to the storm, they made pretty good money. They were pretty carefree, did what they had to do, or I'll take care of it next week. Okay, so next week never really got here. And then they run into this little problem where they got furloughed or laid off or whatever the case may be, and all that money that they could have put away, save for a rainy day, however you want to say it, is now not available to them. So now they're back to living paycheck paycheck to paycheck, whereas in the beginning they could put a paycheck up on the doggone dresser and not even worry about it for a couple of days. They didn't have to race to the bank and things of that nature. What we're dealing with in this day and age is people who do not know how, and I've got to raise my hand on that because until I met this wonderful woman by the name of Sharon, I had an issue with trying to keep a budget. Now, I ain't going to sit here and make like I'm perfect, and there's somebody listening to me today. Please, please listen to me. This isn't something that happens overnight. It takes time to make these things happen. I do the best I can to stay on budget. Sometimes I go over budget, and I bless God for my wife because there are times when she's had to bail me out. Yeah, I said it. She had to bail me out. But the truth of the matter is you learn from the lesson and you move forward. How can we keep a balance in our relationship if I'm going to keep making the same mistake over and over and over and over and over? Somewhere down the line, she might turn around and say, look, enough is enough, all right? Am I making sense when I say what I say? Yeah, yeah absolutely. absolutely. Hey, hey, oh, uh, uh, one more time, let me please explain to the uh, listening audience that his wife gave him a financial bailout he was not in jail. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> All right. Thank you for clearing that up. Thank you for clearing that up. But, 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 here, this tonight. Here's, here's, but here's what I want. Here's what I want. Because, again, people do not talk about finances in their marriage. No. And so then when you got a – 
I went through this. I went through this, which I still don't understand how. But years ago, I used to live in Birmingham, Alabama. That's when. That's about the time I met you, uh, overseer, when I was living in Birmingham, Alabama. And uh, mm-hmm. I remember. I remember I was married at the time, and I was in full time ministry. At that time, I literally traveled everywhere that I had to go and minister. So I was up and down through Indiana, up and down through uh, uh, Tennessee, up and down through New York and and Massachusetts and Connecticut and, you know, and and just up and down the Carolinas and Virginia. I'm I'm traveling all these places. Now, listen at me. I'm in full-time ministry, so my focus is this word. So the average night, this was my schedule, the average night when it was time to go to bed, so at about 11 o'clock at night, I'm in my office, and I'm in the Word of God until about 6.30 in the morning. At that time, my wife, she was getting up to go to work, and I would be just getting ready to go to bed because I had been up all night studying the Word of the Lord and getting things together so that when I traveled, I wouldn't have to stress about what it was that I was going to share with the people of God. And so I would travel these places I would minister, and I would make out pretty well, not to brag or boast, but you know, at that time, I would go out for three nights or or five nights, and I would come home, amen, with $1,500 to $3,000, amen, for the month after being out, amen, and so now, let me remind you, I'm living in a two-bedroom, one-and-a-half bathroom apartment that only cost me $220 a month, y'all may not believe me, I'm telling you, $220 $220 a month, that's uh, all it cost me. The, the place of the sanctuary, li- li- listen, listen, the sanctuary that I was using only cost me $350 a month. Now, I just had to pay all of the utilities and expenses. But now, now, she was working for an insurance company. This is transparent. I don't think I've ever told people this much. But she was working for an insurance company while I'm doing this ministry. And one day, she decided, I'm going to quit my job, and I'm going to travel with you. And I said, wait a minute, woman. I said, wait a minute. I said, the people ain't calling for you. I said, they calling for me, so you got to stay put. And she said, well, I don't quit my job. Now, I, I couldn't understand it, and it really troubled me. And since it troubled me, I'm sitting here saying, okay, Lord, you're going to have to help me because I wasn't as saved uh, then as I am now. So, you know, I said a few choice words even as a preacher. I'm sorry. I'm just telling the truth. And glory to God. And I had to let a few things out. And so in that time, here's what happened. I was I was out handling some business for the house, and she and I were together. I were, and I remember I had my car. I had an 88 Volkswagen Fox. It was a five-speed. Man, that thing get me up and down the road. So we're going around handling business, handling business. So I come to the house, the apartment. I've got an eviction notice. My rent ain't been paid in two months. I'm saying, Whoa. wait a minute. Now, cause, now, listen, I need you to hear me. I need you to hear me. I was the man that when I got my money, I didn't waste no time. I put it in her hands. Listen at me. I put the money in her hands. And for, so for me to come home after handling business, for me to see that there was an eviction notice on the door and I had to be out in 72 hours bothered me. I mean, and I mean, when I say it bothered me, it bothered me. And my father was alive and I called my father. I went to the church office and I was crying and I called my father and I said, I just don't understand. I said, but I'm doing all that I'm going to do it. And I'm kind of, and my, my dad said, son, he said, calm down, take a deep breath. He says, tell you what, he says, he says, I'm going to, I'm going to call, I'm going to call your sister and I'm going to tell the Western Union you some money. And, um, uh, and then I called another relative and I got some money wired to me. Here's what I had to do. I didn't have enough of what was wired to me to take care of what was necessary to get, because when the, when I got the eviction notice that very night, the lights went off. Not to mention, there was no phone in the house. I'm trying to figure out why these things haven't been paid because I didn't take the money for myself. I gave her the money. Please hear what I'm saying. I gave him because Mm. that's what I believed I was supposed to do as a man. I'm supposed to bring my money home. That's what I believed. And so I got all of these things going on. So what happened is I had to now start taking my instruments. 
from the church. I'm not, please hear what I'm saying. I had to take my instruments from the church and go to a pawn shop and pawn them so that I could get all the money with what was sent from family members to stay in the apartment, put the lights back on. Please hear what I'm saying. And so she's sitting here, well, you know, uh, well, if you were working, this wouldn't have been. I'm bringing the money. How is it if I was working when I'm bringing you the money? And I'm not talking about a little bit of money. Now, here's the thing I couldn't understand, that if I wanted something, we never had money. But then mm-hmm. if she wanted something, she found the money to get what she wanted because there was a sale. So this is what I'm saying. These were things I wish I knew then what I know now. We would have had some conversations that would have went differently. I'm trying to help somebody because you're sitting here and you're saying, I don't understand why this is not being able to be paid and why I can't get this done and why this can't seem to get done. Who's sitting there gambling with the money? Who's sitting there spending the money unwisely? Who's sitting there doing something they shouldn't be doing with the finances? Somebody not talking about it. Somebody not dealing with what's necessary to be dealt with. There's got to be some priorities. You've got to put some things in place and in order so that God can show you what he wanted you to encounter in marriage. That's why people are miserable right now because they are so financially in trouble they don't know what to do. They are so financially messed up that it's driving them crazy. And that's why you have some men who kill their wives. You have some wives who kill their husband. You have some who have an affair. You have some who do this and they do that. Why? Because they had the nerve to say for better or for worse, for richer or for poorer. You did not get married for no poorer. You did not get no married for no worse. You got married so your life would be better, but you can't get it better Mm -hmm. if you don't get some stuff in order. I don't know who I'm talking to tonight. I don't know who's listening tonight, but I need somebody to gravitate to this because finances is one of the legs in your relationship chair that if it is not straight, you will not have a good chair to sit on. Can I get somebody Mm -hmm. to say something to me? Can I buy a vow for a dollar? Amen. All right. Well. You know, they also had a saying of no romance without the finance. Oh. <laughs> oh. That's a bought relationship in my book. <laughs> Jesus. Come on. Well, you know, Come on. And, 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 and I'm hearing what you're saying, and I, I'm hearing your heart. I do recall us having that conversation a number of years ago, Apostle. Mm-hmm. And, you know, even to this day, if you recall, uh, in that conversation, something uh, of importance came up that we did say. And I'm, I'm going to try to bring it back up to the surface. And I don't remember, if, don't know if you remember hearing this. But we kind of discovered at that particular time that that individual was not with you or for you. Because if she were with you, she would have done right by you. So... I mean, we had that conversation. We've been talking like this, and we've been talking like brothers for God knows how long. I mean, from day one when we first met. And I like to believe that the, the three of us brothers plus the sisters, we like to be real with one another. Real is simply that there are people who are dealing, men who are dealing with women and women who are dealing with men that are only there for what they can get out of that relationship. They're not really interested in seeing any productivity in that relationship. They're not really interested in seeing any advancement in that relationship. They are just there, and they're going for the ride. You said it earlier, I believe. Uh, you know, as long as there is some money, and you were talking about friends at that particular time, but even in relationships, in marriages, as long as there is some type of substance. Now, please forgive me for those of you who are listening by way of podcast or even those of you who are listening by way of Facebook Live because I, I try not to be a, 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 a vulgar person. I'm not going to say anything vulgar. I'm just trying to I'm gonna paint the picture you read between the lines. If, it, it, if They're either there to see what they can get out of you in the area of sex or in the area mm. of money. And if they can get a mm. long ride, read between the lines. If they can get a long ride, they're going to stay in stride, okay? And if mm. they can get some fun, if they can comp, catch up with some funny money, they stay in for the ride. But the minute either of them runs dry or comes to a place in right. where it's no longer what they think it ought to be, all they hollering is next. And this ain't no basketball mm. game. They just holler next. Jesus. Mm. 
that was clean Jesus. enough. That was clean. That was the old sign. That was the old sign that people used to put on their car. It said, you can ride with me for cash, grass, or your car. Yes, yes, yes. Are you right? (laughs) What was the last one? I didn't say it. Uh, Ash. Okay. Ash. <laughs> okay. I got. <you>. <laughs> <laughs> See, and, and so the thing is that the sign, the sign was saying, "Don't use me." Right. Mm-hmm. Pay me. See, that that's really what the statement meant. Don't don't uh-huh. use me. Don't abuse me. Participate. Amen. See, and even in this discussion tonight, that's what we're trying to encourage people to understand. Your conversation about Pilate is participation. Then following through with the plan of your conversation is Uh participation. Hmm. All right. Participation, then it brings you into agreement. Amen. And not only hmm. that, but when you get past agreement, don't be a dipper. You always right. have to dip it. Oh, well, I just had to do this. I just had to. no, you didn't. No, you didn't. You're still trying to operate as a single person in a marriage. That's right. Mm-hmm. So I, I'm gonna leave that. I, I'm gonna I'm gonna leave that alone because that's a whole other revelation. We talking about finance tonight. That's all right. Mm-hmm. So you you are in the house. You are in the house. Bust it open. Bust it open. But 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 see, really, that's the truth of the matter. A lot of times, folks are married with a single heart. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. And that's why they do what they do. Anytime you can jump up and just take a trip and don't and don't consider your mate, don't talk about it with them. You you got a single heart. In any time, so wait a minute. The, the man, anytime the man can jump up and just go buy a suit and a new pair of shoes and a brand new shirt and tie set to go with it, and you have not considered are all the bills taken care of, you know, or, or have we even made a payment? On the bill, but you just jump up and go buy the new suit and everything because you don't want to look good going to church on Sunday. Uh-huh. So, 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 what you're saying is that they they have a single heart, but they don't have a joined heart. No, mm-hmm. no. Mm-hmm. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> That's what so I'm they saying. still living. So, and, and, my the, and the is, problem, and the problem is. The problem is they got married for the hump, but they forgot life brings you some bumps, too. Okay. All right. Okay. Okay. So they got married, but they didn't get married to be married. They got married to be single. Something they is wrong with that picture. Thank you. Can I, can I, it's can the I, can I, can I put a clarity on that? Come on. Hey, uh, I, I, and if I'm reading this wrong, Apostle Smith, you correct me. They got married just so that they can have the experience of, uh, okay, here we go. I'm sorry, Apostle uh, Whitlow. I hope you don't kick me off your show. Some of them got married for the sake of vaginal masturbation, and others got married for the sake of dictatorial pleasure. Uh, That's all. That's what it was. Uh, okay. I mean, let's get real here. Let's just go ahead. You, you said in the beginning okay. of the show, it's Raw, it's real, it's relevant. It is. Come on. It, and it is. Some folks got well, married let me, for the sake of sex. They did not get married. Let, let, uh, let me, you know. Go ahead. Let, let me connect with you on that statement. Because the sad thing is, now, all of you that are not saved and not in church, this may or may not affect you. 
But the sad Mm -hmm. thing is that even in the body of Christ, every now and then you hear them say, oh, yeah, I'm getting mad because we ain't supposed to have sex unless you marry. Well, you get married for the wrong reasons, leave it alone. Mm-hmm. Uh oh, come on. See that See, that's a whole, now that is a whole other topic. They're, they're, te- they're telling you right there our whole mm-hmm. purpose of getting together is it, to knock them boots and, and let me see if I can put another hole in it and, and all this kind of stuff. Your idea uh, of marriage, <laughs> your idea of marriage is already getting ready to crash. Mm-hmm. That's because they don't see marriage as a ministry. They don't see marriage as an assignment. They don't see marriage as God's intent to bring forth purpose and destiny. So, so, so then watch this, because you said something, Apostle Smith, that makes me want to dive into this next thing, that people who are they're getting married, but they're still operating single. They have their single hearted, mm-hmm. but they're not joined. So, which tells me that debt has become an issue in marriage. And so, because debt has become an issue, it interferes with their, ilabil- their ability to function financially. See, but when debt is the issue, then these couples have to employ various tools and strategies to start paying off debt and to get on a better financial footing. This is why a lot of men don't want to get married unless they are uh, financially stable. But if the truth be told, a man will never be financially stable unless he hits the lottery. Let's just be truthful, because in today's time, I don't care how much money you make, for some reason, it's never enough. Mm. Let's just be truthful. You you work, you work, you work, you work, and they don't pay but so many dollars per hour, and and it's not going to really cut meet the need. That's why there's a lot of people who go to a factory, because they know if they go become a factory worker, they know they got a job that's going to last them a long time. And and even if they don't get a whole lot of money, as long as they're doing the work, they know they got a check coming in every week. Uh, but 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 the problem is that getting a check is not necessarily meeting the need, because you can get Amen. a check for two dollars and fifty cents every week. What is two dollars and fifty cents going to do for you? In today's time, you might you be lucky if you get a a stick a stick of gum. Mm-hmm. I mean, let's just be truthful. Let's just be truthful. Uh, and so 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 debt has caused a lot of people in marriage to be messed up. Matter of fact, if we be truthful, some people have gotten married because of debt, because they're thinking that who they work for, if they're married, they will get more money, especially if you're in military. Because if you're in military and you're in debt and you get married, you get something called a VHA. That is a visitor's housing allowance, which means the the, um, the military will pay you a few extra hundred dollars because you have now what is called a dependent. All right. All right. And the whole purpose of the money is to try to pay off some debt. But that's not the way to do it. That's not the way Mm. to do it. So you've got people who are burning in their flesh and they're burning in their pocket because they don't know how to conduct themselves or handle what they have. Amen. Right now. So, come on. So, so how are you going to function in a marriage financially when you're both in debt? And speaking of being in debt, let me go ahead and put this out there. If you're in debt when you get married and he's in debt when you get married, then the two of you have to deal with each other's debt. It's not my debt. It's not your debt. It becomes um, our debt. Now, y'all ain't going right. to like me for this, but I'm going to put this mm-hmm. out there. So that means that if if she has a whole lot of credit card debt, then you get married to her, you got to deal with her credit card debt. But if he comes to you with child support debt, then you got to deal with his child support debt. I don't care if you don't want to hear it because you're together. You wanted to be together, well, then you have to deal with life together. You have to deal with the issues together. And if that is the issue, then, baby, deal with it. I, I, All right. Can I throw something I I I ain't Can got I, nothing to do with that. I ain't got nothing to do with that. Because Yes you do. You, you married me. You, yes you do. 
You, oh, yeah, you made them babies. With, you made them babies with Sally. I ain't got nothing to do with that. The whole well, you married, married me, it. and so it interferes with the finances. Now, you know what? Let me say this, Apostle Smith, Apostle Whitlow, Sister Glenda, I know you want to jump in there, but let me say this. Say that to the IRS when they tax your pay and tax your spouse's pay, trying to get back child support. Tell them, tell them you ain't got nothing to do with that. Now you're going to spend the next mm. few years in court trying to recover what you think belongs to you. I had a situation, uh, and this was in my younger days, where I did, I had two boys biologically, okay, and uh, one of my boys, uh, his mom put him on welfare, and he, she didn't have to, but she did. And the bottom line was the state came and tried to collect from me. Not only did the state try to collect from me for the one of my sons, they tried to collect from me from her three or four other children. Now, Pastor Smith, I know you know what I'm talking about, but I'm not going to say names because, personally, we've been around each other over 40 years, so you know what I'm talking about. Try to make me pay for four other children that didn't belong to me. All I'm simply saying is say I ain't got nothing to do with that, and then tell the state that when the time comes to collect money. Mm. Come on, because they're going to get their money one way or another. They're and going to get something. And when you... And when you file taxes together, they're going to tax that portion that goes to him, and it might take some of yours, too. Exactly. It's that simple. It's that simple. So what I'm saying is that if you're in debt and he's in debt, when y'all get married, y'all have to take on each other's debt. I don't know why y'all want to put, well, it ain't my issue. It ain't my problem because I didn't create it. Well, he didn't create your debt, but he married you. So how come you want him to take care of yours, but you don't want to take care of his? How come y'all ain't going to do it together? See, that, see, that's the stuff people don't like, because that's what you call real talk. That's what Because here's the thing. If you're going to deal, if you're going to be in marriage, you have to deal with the issues that come in the marriage or come against the marriage if you want to have a successful marriage. All right. Okay, question. Uh, I mean, uh-huh. no comment. Okay. Now, okay. uh, which is what I was going to say. Okay, you come to the, let's say you come together and you talk about the finances prior to the marriage. Okay, wouldn't it be, and I'm just saying this now, wouldn't it be better that we try to, uh, wouldn't it be better that we tackle or try to tackle these finances on our own prior to getting married? Or if it's where we got to get married right away, and we do this together. Now, uh, to eliminate a lot of problems, like somebody said, well, well, that's your problem or that's, you know, such and such. Me personally, uh, if I ever get married again, I want to be able to, to take care of some of my debt before I get married. That's just me. I'm not saying everybody is like that, but I, I don't want to go in a marriage with a lot of debt, you know, depending on that other person to, you know, take care of his debt for me. You know, that's well, just let me, my opinion. That's just not let me say this. Let me, let me, let me say this, okay? If, if you could handle your debt before you got married, mm-hmm. then you wouldn't mm-hmm. be in debt. Let's just tell the truth. And if, because, okay. let's, let, let's be even more, let's go even further than that. If it were possible... Mm-hmm. To, because mm-hmm. because now listen, I don't know I don't know your financial status. I know good and mm-hmm. well that if uh, if you are if you're in fifteen thousand dollars worth of debt, let's just put a figure out there. Let's say your debt is fifteen thousand mm-hmm. dollars, and let's say his child support is twenty eight thousand dollars. I'm just throwing random figures out there. Well, if you had mm-hmm. fifteen thousand dollars, wouldn't you have paid your debt? They, they say that. Um, but you don't have fifteen thousand dollars. Hmm. Let's say. And okay. while you don't have fifteen thousand dollars, wait a minute. And while you don't have the fifteen thousand dollars, if he had twenty eight thousand dollars, he would have paid that debt that off. But since he don't have that, he's being realistic. And now let's tell the truth that your your debt is not waiting for you to live your life. So you mean mm-hmm. to tell me you gonna put your life on hold because you're in debt? Huh? No, well, no. I'm just saying that. I wouldn't want it to be a problem going into a brand 
new marriage and ha- and having debt be a problem because we may say, oh, it's no problem. Okay, we're going to come together. But sometimes, you know, un- unfortunately, it does become a problem. So I'm, that's it does. That's what I'm but, but you know why it becomes a problem? The reason it becomes a problem is because you are dealing with a person who is not really there to deal with the issues at hand. They are there, as uh, as Apostle Smith said, because they're burning, because they okay. want some. She wants to be stuck. Okay. He wants to be stroked. That's the bottom okay. line. And if that's why you're getting married, then ain't nothing else going to be accomplished. Because right. let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. Being in debt is really a turn off. And so mm-hmm. you come into exactly. a marriage being in debt, and you, it's a turn off, yes. But here's, the, but here's the reality, right? You're not going to stop living life because you're in debt. Because let's tell the truth. Ain't nobody, I don't mm-hmm. care, unless you was a bona fide virgin, ain't nobody going to sit around and say, well, let's wait until we get this thing under control. Because you know what your body going to do? It's going to tap you. It's going to be like, yo, hey, I need some attention here. This right here is itching me. This right here is throbbing me. I need some attention. I need to be rubbed. I need to be felt. I need to be touched. Let's just tell the truth. Your body ain't going to wait for you because you're in debt. I <laughs> out. My goodness. I'm just saying, see, y'all done got quiet on me. Y'all done left me all by myself. I didn't hear quiet. No, no, no. <laughs> I'm listening, Apostle. I, I didn't get quiet. I was trying to give everybody else a chance to talk. You're right in what you're saying. And a lot of people, uh, they'll tell you, now, you know, this is the most common mistake made among believers in this day and age. And anybody on this line or anybody that's watching by way of Facebook or anybody that's what, listening by way of pet podcast. If you turn around and say that this has not happened to you, you just straight up lying. Yeah, I said it. You can call me, write me, or do whatever you want to do. When you get to that point in place where you think you're so strong and so powerful in the Lord that nothing can touch you and nothing can uh, uh, change your, 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 your demeanor, everybody, and I do mean everybody, has a break point. I'm kind of uh, likening that to Jesus and his 40 days and 40 nights in the wilderness. When you're being tempted or tested, learning how to say no becomes vital. I'm not saying that you can't withstand the test, but you cannot deny the fact that the temptation comes up in your mind to give in to whatever is going on. Now, we all, you already established earlier about those who get married for the wrong reasons. We still have that going on today. I mean, people are trading in their marriages like they're cars now. I mean, they're married for six months, and then the next thing you know, you see them again later, and they got a new husband or they got a new wife. And oh, what happened to so-and-so? Uh, well, that didn't work out, so I just moved on. What kind of madness? Since when did irreconcilable differences become the norm to where Christians who are better than 68% in the divorce rate. When did that become the norm for us? Well, here's the thing. You have to understand that we know the Bible says that God hates divorce, but God said because of the hardness of the heart. When the that's heart right. is hardened, that's where irre- irre- irreconcilable differences come in. So that's why God granted a bill of divorce being written through Moses. Because of the hardness mm-hmm. of heart. So we have to mm-hmm. look at that. And so there are people that when their heart is hardened because they've been disappointed or they feel like they've been bamboozled and they feel like they have not been uh, treated fairly, the hardness of the heart says, forget this, yo, I'm out, peace, deuce, later, see ya, ain't coming back. Mm-hmm. That's the reality. Apostle, also let me say, we we love to pull that terminology out of scripture that God hates divorce and he does. But if we would go back and read it, he makes that statement very strongly when he discusses the uh, the situation of a man that marries a young woman. And then want to use her for a punching bag and a karate karate class and all this. 
Then all of a sudden, he sees another beautiful young lady. Now he want to drop this woman that he done pushed around and kicked around. All of a sudden, he wants the new model. So he uh-huh. can do the same punching. So he can do the same punching and kicking and acting the fool. The Bible said that's when the Bible said God hates divorce. Mm-hmm. What happens in a divorce is now this rascal goes free after he done beat this woman to a pulp. Now he going to marry somebody else and wreck her life too. Well, let's that's, why something God, else that's, why, about. that's why God, that's why God hates divorce because it frees people who need something done in their spirit. It ain't about releasing the person you're with. You need something done in your spirit. Mm-hmm. But instead of getting something done in their spirit, they get something done in the courtroom. Mm-hmm. They do that. And then and if God, I can just... It doesn't, it doesn't change the person. It doesn't change the person. It just releases them to make another mess with the next one. Well, that's why I would say this. You, uh, he hates divorce. Yeah, and you're right. You're a thousand percent right in what you're saying. The truth of the, the truth of the whole matter is that people, and I know it says because of the hardness of your heart, a hard heart can't feel. A hard heart has no sympathy. A hard heart has no regard for another's uh, another person's condition situation or circumstance. A hard heart is just exactly what it is. Cold, callous, calculated, Mm -hmm. selfish, self-centered, egotistical. I mean, everything you could come up negative. And I know it said in Jeremiah, the heart is desperately wicked. Who can know it? A hard heart literally is wicked. Yeah, am I saying to somebody who files for divorce for no apparent reason, has a level of wickedness working in them? Yes, I am saying that. I will go on record as saying that because you sat there. I said it before, and I'll say it again. You take that young lady, if you're a man, out of her safety zone, out of the comfort of her father's house and her mother's house, and you make promises to her that you have no desire to keep. And then six weeks, eight weeks, a month, two years down the road, even five years down the road, you break that young lady's heart because you found something that you thought might be just a little better than she is. Yeah, you're wicked. Yes, I did say Well, well, well but overseer, but overseer, you, you cannot be one-sided. You cannot be one-sided because there are some good men out there. And yeah, there what are. they do... Listen, listen, there are some good men out there, and they put their heart in their heart and their soul and their entire being into a woman who is heartless, careless, who is careless and thinks nothing about what he does because she's into herself and she's vain, and she has no problem being who she is towards him. Okay, so therefore, Listen, his heart is not wicked. His heart has just been abused to the point that he's had enough. See, so we can't we can't be one sided. I am not disagreeing with you. I only pick the one side to cover both sides. You're absolutely right in what you're saying. And I mean, you know, and I, as much as I don't want to say this, let's just get down to the reality of it. Where do you think some of these murders come from in these relationships? Because they have been abused to the place and point where they claim they ain't going to take it no more. And then you've got those who are so jealous and insecure, they'll turn around and say, if I can't have you, nobody else is going to have you. Mm-hmm. So we find yeah, ourselves... It becomes a reality. I mean, it's a yeah, reality. But, what do you think do? But, but, but mm-hmm. so, so here's the thing again. Here's the thing. And I have one who says that they understand we were talking about, you know, being in debt. And getting yeah. married before, and, and how to handle it before they get married. They said it's possible to take care of the debt prior to uniting with another, uh, so as to not burden another. They said take a second wow. job or do some. 
freelance work or develop a budget and knock it out before you even get into a relationship. But here is the reality. This body, this mind, this heart is not going to cooperate in that manner. I don't care how disciplined you are. I don't care how anointed you are. The reality is the body wants what it wants. And if you do not accommodate the body, the body will act crazy on you. And before you know it, you'll be molesting somebody's child. And if you're not molesting somebody's child, you'll be you'll be violating your own self for gratification. We have to be realistic. I don't care what nobody say. If we're not realistic, we are not going to get honest results, and we're not going to see the benefits that we should see. Listen, God said it's not good for man to be alone, so debt or no debt is not good. Two are better than one. Two are better than one. It is that simple. I respect that you did it, Miss Sandra Whitfield. I do not I do not fight against what you're saying, but I'm being realistic. You are one out of seven hundred trillion people in the world who has accomplished that. To you, I say congratulations. But everybody knows that is not legitimate or accurate. And the people who are by themselves, who are single, are oftentimes who often not always, but they are oftentimes considered stuck up, messed up, and then some, and be and 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 they don't want no part of a relationship. They don't want no part of marriage. They don't want that. They don't even want no, no part of God. If we really be truthful, I'm gonna leave that alone. Listen, we're talking oh, no, about no, no, these no, financial no, issues. No, I'm, I, I would love to go on. I would love to go on. I'm not out of words. I'm simply out of time. Glory to God. So I want to come back, and I'm going to deal with this finance some more on next week. Amen. Glory to God. And I'm excited about dealing with this stuff. And listen, I want you to hear me, Sandra. I welcome your comment. I welcome difference. I like to hear people's opinions and thoughts. That's why I ask you to share your thoughts, share your comments, share your questions. I receive it. I receive it. I receive it. And I appreciate you, but I just want to be truthful about the matter because you got to understand there's a difference between a man's perspective and a woman's perspective and then what God really wants us to see and what God really wants us to know. Having said that, I am not out of words. I'm simply out of time. And I would urge you to join me on next week, Saturday night at 10 o'clock Eastern time, 9 central for making marriage meaningful. We're getting out of here. Kim and Kim, get that music ready. But I say this to you, and I need you to get this in your sanctified spirit, that if you want your marriage to be meaningful, then your mate cannot be meaningless. It is as simple as that. If you're married tonight, your husband tap you on the shoulder, roll over. And if you're not married and you're feeling some kind of way that you need some attention, take a cold shower. You'll be just fine. The Lord bless you. Until next time, we say shalom, shalom. Shalom. Shalom.